Suppose we want to animate some geometric figures. Maybe a triangle in a pentagon. It's going to be a non-interactive animation, perhaps to add some excitement to our main menu. We could script the animation, but no matter how well crafted on how long the animation would be, it will still be fixed and finite, and it will get boring. It is best to animate simple shapes procedurally. So let's list our goals. 1. The animation must be random, unscripted. More so, it must not have a scripted feel. So this excludes manipulating or chaining canned sequences. 2. We need precise control. While we want a range of outputs that feels endless, we also want to make sure we don't get unexpected behavior. 3. We want the animation to be dynamic, but always smooth, continuous, without singularities. And 4. We want it to be interesting and beautiful, at least in a mathematical way. This is easier said than done, of course. A mix of periodic functions, randomness and smoothing might get us close, but it will be complex, ad hoc and still far from ideal. Luckily, we code in Rust, and the modulator crate we recently released provides types which, in combination, have all of the properties we wish for, and then some. Modulators are sources of animation fully decoupled from the destinations they are factored into. Their usefulness goes beyond adding flair to visual elements. They can be used to give complexity, interest and depth to any simulation parameter. The application you are looking at is called Modulator Play. It is a playground to test, to experiment with a modulator crate. Play is based on Piston Window, a cross-platform library that makes getting up and running with Rust quick and easy. Modulator Play builds on Piston's 2D graphics by adding a few very expressive rendering primitives. It is also a simple, ready-to-extend way to get exploring the Rust ecosystem. There are links in the description to the modulator crate in the repositories for the Create and Play application on GitHub. Here is the definition of the modulator trait. The trait itself is very simple. Only two methods are key. Value, which returns the modulator's value at the current position in time, and advance, which, given an elapsed delta, evolves the modulator forward as a function of time. In practice, you will often not call advance directly, as collecting modulators into a host is more convenient. The modulator crate provides one such host type called modulator env. This is an owning host, meaning that you create a modulator, set it up, and then give it to the host, which will manage its lifetime for you, including advancing it and dropping it when no longer needed. Let's take a look at a use case in the Modulator Play app. Here, the application creates three modulator environments as part of a struct called state data. During the frame update function, as long as the simulation is not paused, the application advances the environments by dt microseconds, its current frame elapsed. The environments, in turn, advance the enabled modulators they contain. Elsewhere in the application, Modulators are created, set up, and given to one of the environments to host. The Wave Modulator is the simplest of the types provided by the crate, but it has its uses. It takes and stores a closure to compute its value, and it has amplitude and frequency as data members. Here, we create a new Wave Modulator, then we give it to the environment M1. The take method of the environment is used to transfer ownership and assign a symbolic name to the modulator, in this case, waveform. The next line has to do with the buffered rendering I will show a little bit later. After that, we call into set wave shape. In this function, we select between various closures to install into the wave modulator. 
Let's watch them in action in the Play Viewer. Here is a plot of the wave modulator with the sine closure selected. The wave's amplitude is being modulated by another modulator. That's why the amplitude changes and the waveform seems to zoom in and out. Notice the triangle at the top right. It is using the value of this wave as its rotation. It's another way to visualize the effect of the modulator over time. Let's look at the other closures we can cycle by pressing 1. Here's a triangle wave. A square wave. And a sawtooth wave. Because it's based on a closure, the wave modulator could return really anything. Constant, a random number, or a periodic function like we've done so far. Here is an example of using the wave modulator with a closure that implements a simple random walk. In this case, we offset the current modulator value at each advance by plus or minus the frequency parameters, and we bound the result to the plus or minus of the amplitude value. Here's what it looks like. As expected, it is a simple random walk that remains within the given bounds. Let's move on to the modulators that have the properties that we need to implement the animation we described at the beginning of this video. Here, we create a modulator of type Scalar Goal Follower. This type needs to be given a submodulator it will take ownership of. The type of the submodulator should support being given a goal and moving towards it. The wave with the periodic function would not work since it's not going to get closer to the goal. But there are other types that do, such as the scalar spring we are using in this example. Here, we are adding some regions to the follower. What's going to happen is that the follower is going to pick a goal from inside one of these regions, set it as the current goal for its submodulator, and then it is going to wait until the submodulator's value gets within a threshold distance to the goal and is within a threshold speed. When these conditions are met, it considers the goal as arrived at. So you might wait a bit, then pick a new goal from a region, set it and repeat the process. Let's watch it in action. Here we see the follower driving its spring modulator. Notice how it sets a goal, the line on the left always connects to the current one, waits for arrival, and then picks a short pause and a new goal. This is where we specify the submodulator for the follower. We gave it a scalar spring with 0.3 seconds of smoothing and a 5.0 undamping factor. Scalar spring moves towards its set goal with smoothing seconds of delay, critically damping its arrival so that it slows down and stops exactly at the goal, without overshooting or oscillating. But if oscillations are desired, you can specify an undamping value that reduces damping, and therefore allows overshooting as the spring reaches its goal. Let's look at it in action. Notice how the spring overshoots and bounces around until it settles. This is because of the undamping we specified. Let's turn undamping off. Now, observe how the critical damping ensures that the goal is reached without overshooting. With undamping equal to zero, the spring is mathematically guaranteed never to overshoot its target. Look at the top right triangle. Again, it is using the modulator value as its rotation. Notice how much closer the combination of follower and damped spring gets us to our original goal of random, smooth, but controllable motion. There is another type of modulator that can do even better, the Newtonian. Here, we are creating another goal follower, but this time, instead of giving it a spring as its modulator, we are giving it a Newtonian. The Newtonian is the most complex and probably the most useful of the provided types when it comes to adding organic, predictable motion. It uses classical mechanics to accelerate, sustain at speed, 
and then decelerate towards a goal. The movement parameters given to it are ranges, and every time the modulator begins a journey towards the goal, it picks a random value from each of the ranges. The first, here 2 to 12, is the max speed. The second and third, here 4 and 24, are acceleration and deceleration ranges, respectively. When a Newtonium begins to move towards its goal, it accelerates at the selected rate until it gets to the selected maximum speed, sustains it for as long as it can, and then decelerates at the selected rate so that it comes to a stop at exactly the goal. Let's watch it in action. The analytical solution to the motion ensures the movement is always smooth and it optimally satisfies its constraints. For example, if there is not enough time to reach maximum speed, the value will accelerate as much as it can, while ensuring that it will slow down at the selected rate and still come to a zero speed stop exactly at the goal. The resulting animation is random, controlled, and always continuous. Watching the triangle rotate in the top right shows another property of the Newtonian. Its physically correct exponential motion curves register instinctively as pleasant, even beautiful, since our brains are conditioned to appreciate these natural patterns. The crate provides one more type of modulator, very different from the others and suitable for different applications. Inspired by classic analog shift registers like those used in modular synthesizers, the shift register uses a number of value buckets, six of them in this example, where each bucket can have a value randomly selected within the given range, minus 3 to 3 in this case. The value of the modulator is the value of the bucket it's positioned on, and over time the modulator moves from one bucket to the next. Every time it moves, it has a certain probability of selecting new value for the bucket it just left. In this example, the odds are 0.05 or 5% that a bucket value will be updated. The time it takes for the modulator to visit all of its buckets is called the period. In this example, the period is set to last one second, so it will take that long for the modulator to visit all six of its buckets. The age range values we set in the next line can be used to further shape the odds of values being replaced. In this example, the odds stay at 5% for 5 periods, then rise linearly to 100% by period 30. Unless you set an age range, the odds never change. Let's watch it in action. Notice how the value buckets, 6 of them in this case, represented by the horizontal lines, are visited once per period, 6 per second here. As time goes on, the values change as selected by the odds we programmed. This makes for a random pattern that still evolves organically over time. In this mode, the shift register is sampling the buckets without any interpolation. But we can choose to go from bucket to bucket linearly, like this. Or even quadratically, using polynomial interpolation. This greatly smooths out the output of the shift register. The shift register can be very useful for image and audio synthesis, AI, or any other application where these kinds of controlled evolving random sequences can be factored into simulation parameters. These are the modulators currently included with the crate. One final note on the modulator host. The provided environment type is just a convenience. There is no requirement to use it. You could just as easily choose a different approach to managing the lifetime and evolution of your modulators, perhaps in a way that does not require trade objects or transfer of ownership. You can keep modulators around without having them being hosted at all. The wave and shift register modulators can serve the role of generators while spring and Newtonian can be used to smooth out and enrich the motion of visual elements. Finally, the modulators provided by the crate are dedicated to implementing the trait. They don't have any other function. But you could add modulator functionality to any of your own types by implementing the trait for them. And now, 
Let's take a quick look at the modulator playing rendering primitives. Play adds some expressive rendering primitives implemented in prims.rs. It all starts with this simple struct, which lets us specify color and cap style and thickness setting for each endpoint of a line segment. The most basic method to draw is draw line, which takes the endpoints of a line and a drop arms which defines the rendering parameters. On the left side here are three examples of rendering lines with draw line. We can toggle rendering of debug quads to see how they're drawn. Things get more interesting once you render sets of lines instead of single ones. Method Draw Lines takes an array of line segments and a symmetrical array of drop arms and draws them all at once, but with a nice addition. When Connect Subs is set to something greater than zero, it sets the number of subdivisions to draw a connector between the endpoint of a line segment and the start point of the next. Thickness and other properties are correctly interpolated across the connector. These two lines at the top left are drawn as a single set with a connector between them. Most of their attributes are being animated by modulators, of course. If we disable the connectors, you can see the line segments more clearly. These end gone primitives at the bottom will be described next but you can see already how the connectors are what glues the varying animating line segments together. The connectors are drawn using exponential sweeps over the complex plane, as opposed to interpolating angles. This has many of the same advantages that quaternion interpolation offers in 3D. Notice how well formed the sweep is for the lines, at least until the connector ends are parallel and pointing in the same direction, at which point the connector has to flip. The sweep does not pinch or degenerate, even when the endpoints have different thickness. Let's turn on debug quads again to see the generated geometry. Thanks to the sweeps and the animated line segment lengths, we are able to morph the square end gone into a circle, and the hexagon with animated line thickness can generate the varied connecting shapes you see. These engons are generated using a utility function in prims.rs. This function takes a number of sides, a line segment scaling factor, and a drop arms to span the output, and returns line segments and drop arms vectors that can be given directly to draw lines for rendering. Here is draw lines again. You can call it with the lines and palms returned by Ngon to draw the desired geometric figure. Notice also that there is a draw lines field right below draw lines. This is exactly the same as draw lines, but it automatically fills the geometric figure it's given. Obviously, filled shapes are going to work best when they're closed, as it is the case with Ngons. Notice that draw lines filled automatically determines the center point and averages the line segment colors across the set to find a good approximation. We can see this more clearly by disabling the connectors again. There are other convenient methods to draw primitives in prims.rs, but one in particular is useful as it is used to draw the plots we saw earlier for the modulators. Draw lines auto takes a set of line segments and a single drop arms, meant to span the given range of line segments. It automatically generates the intermediate drop arms and then calls draw lines with the result. Thickness and color are interpolated over the entire set. Caps are used for the first and the last segment and connectors are generated in between, as requested. Draw Lines Auto can generate a wide range of rendering styles. We control over segment scaling, including the ability to have scaling dynamically match interpolated thickness, support for closed, filled shapes, and the ability to tweak the interpolation rate away from linear and into exponential. 
draw lines auto is how buffers of evenly sampled modulator values are plotted here. You can check modulator plays code to see how it's done. But really, it is just a call to draw lines auto with line segments connecting the collected samples. A similar technique is used to render cubic curves, which is what I'm going to show you next. Modulator play includes an implementation of interactive, very efficient 2D cubic curves in Bezier.rs. Eventually, this functionality will be expanded and probably moved into its own crate. But for now, it's just a module of the modulator play application. Defining and evaluating a cubic Bezier curve is very easy. Doing so efficiently so that the curve can be drawn with optimal sampling and minimal artifacts is anything but. Our implementation uses the determination metrics described by the late researcher Maxim Shemanarev. This gives better results than any other approach we have seen. The cubic curve structure defines the curve and provides a comprehensive set of operations. Samples along the curve are cached and recomputed only on demand. Curve attributes and geometric queries are optimized by linear approximation whenever possible. Operations that can be exact are, such as tangent and normal to the curve calculation. Let's look at it in action. The cubic curve type has no notion of rendering and no methods to do so. A draw curve method in prims.rs takes a curve and a drop arms, generates the line rendering segments from the curve data, and then calls draw lines auto to plot it. This is very efficient, and it implies that the rendering features we described earlier are also available to draw curves. Curve rendering also has options to draw properties such as samples, tangents, control points, and more. It supports debug drawing and curve editing. Minimal sampling gives us efficient and correct curve evaluation, even with pinching and sharp cusps. But another factor that makes the curve render so nicely is that we're using the prims.rs line set rendering. The sweeps smooth out any sharp turns and make the curve look beautiful. Disabling the connectors shows the line segments generated along the curve. Finally, we cannot forget that we have modulators available for us to animate everything. So we will close this introduction to the modulator crate and the play app by animating the control points of the cubic curve using Newtonian and follower modulators. Notice how even a completely random plane animation has an organic quality when executed via physically correct modulation. This is it for this introduction. We hope you will find these systems useful for your own applications. Please leave any questions or concerns in the comments and we will do our best to address them. Goodbye.